spread with a really thick wall so there won't be that many of them crushed. And like, if the wet few get crushed, they're making them into ketchup anyway. After harvest, trucks take the tomatoes to a ketchup factory, like Del Monte in Hanford, California. Here, they process over a billion pounds of tomatoes a year. This one tub by itself is about 12 and a half tons. And how many of these bins do we get in a day? Well, we run anywhere from 200 to 300 loads a day, just depending on the time of the season. So it's lots and lots of lots tomatoes. Of tomatoes. The tomatoes are getting washed out of the bin and up onto this amazing elevator. It's just this beautiful red elevator now. At the top, the tomatoes fall into a water flume where they ride inside the factory for one last debris check. These workers are pulling out any roots that shouldn't have gotten in this far. But say goodbye to the whole tomato because it's going to the grinder. A heating tank softens the tomatoes for easy seed and skin removal. Then. A series of pipes thrust the chopped tomatoes through an extractor. There's a screen just like this inside this machine. The juice comes inside and is forced out so that the juice goes to further concentration. And the only thing left is the skins and the seeds, Yeah, right? they're coming out right here, as you can see. It's called pomace, right? Pomace, that's correct. Actually, Bobby, that's used for animal feed. It's all right. Later, a truck will take the byproducts to an animal feed lot. Meanwhile, the tomato juice moves into the evaporators. Incoming tomatoes come in with about 95% water. We're reducing that down to about 15% tomato solid, so we have a lot of water to take out with these machines. It concentrates the flavor, it makes a thicker product, and all of that is happening in this huge structure. The last stop is the secret ingredient room, where workers add the final spices that turn what is now puree into ketchup. So this is ketchup. This is ketchup. So we've taken the tomato puree, we've put it in here, it's been agitated with our mix of spices. I want to give it a try. Okay, let's try that. Oh, and it's still warm. Oh, I get a, a really great vinegar sweetness, that sweet-sour combination. It, it's terrific, and let me tell you, it makes me want to eat ketchup warm in the future. The only thing left to do is load up a small sample of ketchup for a slide down the viscosity test ramp. That's right, the viscosity test ramp. Well, we add the ketchup to this chamber right here. We're going to fill it up to the very top. Fill it up to the very top. Stre Even if you it. make a mess, that's OK. Make a mess. OK, now, Bobby, now push that. All right. And what are we testing for? We're testing for the flow. She means the ketchup has to travel a certain distance in a certain amount of time, both of which are closely guarded secrets. Wait for it. Oh, that's a nice thick ketchup. Does this, this look good? It's perfect. Okay. Perfect. Most of us like our ketchup thick, but when commercial ketchup production began in the mid-1800s, it was watery and thin, mainly because manufacturers used unripe tomatoes. Less than four hours after the tomatoes entered the plant, they end up inside a ketchup bottle. And there you have it. One quick squirt, and our cheeseburger and french fry meal is ready to eat. Well, I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it myself. You know, all the hardworking people and the cool machinery and the hairnets. Needless to say, I'll, I'll never look at a cheeseburger and fries the same way again. But after all that, how does it taste? Mm. Oh, it's great. I'm Bobby Bogner. And this is Food Tech.